As Russia's war enters its third month, the focus has shifted towards eastern Ukraine. That change in terrain means Ukraine will need a new strategy to fend off Russian aggressors. Margarita Konaev is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Rita, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Good morning. So the Russian military entered Crimea in 2014 and really faced very little resistance. What has the what was the state of Ukraine's military then, and how has it changed over these last eight years? That's a really important question because I think it also really helps us understand the trajectory of this war and a lot of the surprises that we've seen uh, in the beginning and going into the third month, as you said. In 2014, the Ukrainian military was small, poorly trained, poorly equipped, and riddled by corruption and general ineffectiveness and lack of professionalism. Since then, the changes have been really robust and fundamental. And we're not just talking about the size and levels of professionalism and the new equipment that have come about, but even the general structure of the military, the fact that they've introduced elements that resemble the command and control structures of NATO countries and the United States, uh, part of it through collaboration, close collaboration with NATO and United States trainers and military uh, professionals that have worked with the Ukrainian military. So we've seen massive improvement in capabilities, in equipment, in professionalisms, in the officer ranks, in the officer corps, and generally in leadership. So that kind of helps And us Rita, you know, Ukraine now has special operations forces. That was exactly. created in 2015, and they're trained by the U.S. What do we know about those capabilities? We know that they've played a really important role in this war. And unfortunately, that also means that they've taken the brunt of the casualties because they have been so much on the front lines. We know less from open source about the type of uh, operations that they've been conducting potentially beyond Ukrainian lines, maybe even in deep in Russian territory. Um, that is, of course, not something that is being confirmed in open source, but there's some, let's say, uh, suspicion that they've also been active there. But inside Ukraine, they're absolutely been instrumental to this continuous excellent performance of the Ukrainian forces. You write that morale is a force multiplier and that Ukrainian fighters are highly motivated and unified. Do you think they'll be able to keep up that momentum as the war drags on? That's an important question, and it's hard to tell because the war has been so brutal and just so violent and very, very difficult on the population itself. But from all the indicators that we've seen now, morale seems to keep up. I think part of it is a really fundamental understanding that Ukraine is fighting for its survival, not just for its territory and not just for any sort of expansion pay or even its sovereignty. It's feels that it's fighting for its survival as an independent nation. So that inevitably fuels morale. You know, in the first part of the war, Ukraine's military adopted unconventional tactics, taking advantage of its small and flexible force structure. Now that the war has moved to eastern Ukraine, will these continue to benefit Ukraine as the fighting continues, or will there be a major pivot? Some of those factors will continue to be important. That flexible command and control that really played to their strengths in the beginning of the war and the first couple of months is going to be important. Some of those asymmetrical tactics, uh, like uh, hitting the supply lines and then retreating into the cities and retreating into the forest around, that is going to be a little harder to execute because you just definitely don't have the same cover and concealment uh, that open that open space essentially doesn't allow in the same way that the terrain of the previous uh, stages of the operations have at this stage of the war the equipment is going to matter even more the military power and equipment uh, that's why the continuous aid that ukraine is receiving from the united states and the west is really really critical I was going to ask you specifically about different weapons and trainings. Can you be a little bit more specific about what you think that they will need going forward? They will continue to need more artillery. Firepower is critical. But at the same time, because Ukraine military, even though it's become much more professionalized and capable and larger, 
Uh, there is a numbers question, and Ukraine cannot afford massive losses. So it's not just a question of firepower, it's a question of distance. So you need these types of weapons that can strike at heavy equipment of the Russians, but they can also do that from a distance. That's why you saw the emphasis of delivering the hot visors to uh, the Ukrainian forces and doing it fast. So a lot of the equipment that they're getting already, it's a question of continuous delivery uh, because this war is probably going to go on for a while. But Rita, isn't it harder now to get those weapons to the front lines given the location? It is. It is increasingly more difficult because uh, the location, the eastern Ukraine is farther away from the borders that Ukraine shares with its Western allies and neighbors. At the same time, those uh, supply lines, they go through Ukrainian territory. So as long as those supply lines are effectively defended and Russia doesn't actively target them, then Ukrainian can continue, uh, can continue supplying its forces in the east. All right, well, Rita, nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.